It was a hot summer night, as myself and my roommate were cleaning out our place, trying to see if there was anything of value that we could sell. You know, so that we could keep up our diet of instant noodles and coffee. As I was digging through the old bags and crates of random junk and old knickknacks, something caught my eye. Underneath a pile of old gaming controllers and bags of clothes was a box. What caught my attention about it was despite being in the attic, buried under boxes and bags, this box, it seemed brand new. No creases, no dents, not even a speck of dust. Out of pure curiosity, I opened the box. And inside, I found five old VHS tapes. What confused me about them was despite the boxing being in what seemed to be perfect condition, these tapes were extremely dusty and rather beat up. They were all titled the same thing, Watch Our Tapes. Seeing as how neither me or my roommate had a VHS player, I was just going to leave them where they were. But for some reason, as if it had me under some kind of spell, I had the sudden urge to bring them downstairs with me, which I did. My roommate saw me coming down the attic ladder, holding the bright box and got pretty excited. Hey, you found something worth some cash, huh? He asked me as I raised the ladder back up. I shrugged and shook my head. Nah, just some old VHS tapes. He looked at me with a face telling me I was being an idiot. Well, why the hell did you bring them down with you? We can't even watch them, he said in confusion. Well, cause... Well, honestly, I have no clue. It's like they wanted me to bring them, I responded. He raised an eyebrow at this before laughing slightly. Dude, you've been watching too many horror movies. I rolled my eyes and carried them to my room. Yeah, yeah, shut up. He laughed. Hey man, if you get a phone call saying you got seven days to live, don't say I didn't warn you, he yelled as he made his way downstairs. I headed to my room and... I threw the box on my nightstand. I opened the box and I began to examine the tapes closer. I figured they were all tarnished and worn down but what really piqued my curiosity was the tape on the VHS where the title was written. Next to the words was this strange symbol which I can only describe as, um, the occult. Looks like a crappy drawing of a stick figure with two lines across what would be the head and one across the torso. While this caught my interest for a few minutes, I eventually put the tapes back down and tried relaxing. But for some reason, my focus always went back to that shiny red box. It eventually dug into me so hard I decided to go out and buy an old VHS player. There was this crummy video store across from our apartment building, still arrogantly keeping its doors open long past the era of video store rentals. I guess it gets by on nostalgia. The odd customers coming in who refused to give up their physical media players in exchange for Netflix. When I returned home, Chris was sitting on the couch, stoned, watching Spongebob. Hey man, where have you been? He asked, pausing the TV. I showed him the VHS player and he laughed. Dude, tell me you didn't spend money to watch those tapes. I flipped him off and began setting it up. Yep, that's exactly what I did, I responded, with Chris giving a small chuckle. After the VHS player was hooked up, I grabbed the tapes and put in tape number one. It was rather uninteresting. 
it was nothing but a man smoking a cigar under a lamppost. That was it. For four whole minutes. It was boring. But what made me feel uneasy was whoever was recording. He was breathing very heavily and the camera shook slightly. The tape ended and me and Chris were stuck staring at each other. Uh, that was weird, he said, rubbing the back of his head, still clearly stoned out of his mind. I agreed and proceeded to put in the next tape. Now, if that first one was unsettling, this one was just straight up horrible. Once again, the man recording was breathing heavily and hiding behind a tree. He then pointed a camera towards a park with children running around. His breathing got even heavier and he then began approaching the kids before it suddenly ended. Oh, holy shit, that was messed up, I muttered. I looked over at Chris, who seemed to be getting a little bit worried. All right, man, that's enough, he said in a shaky voice. I denied his request due to my curiosity. Hey man, if you don't want to watch, you can leave, I responded as I put in the next tape. Chris stood up before slowly sitting back down. As I figured, he'd be too curious too. The tape played and it was disturbing as all hell. The man behind the camera and two other men in masks that looked to be made from deer skulls surrounded a large bag and they all held long, jagged blades. Suddenly, the bag moved and all three men began to stab into it quite violently. Then, it got real disturbing because the bag began spilling out blood. The men just proceeded to stab over and over for about five minutes straight. This caused Chris to vomit on our coffee table. I couldn't really blame him. I felt like doing the same. At this point, Chris had had enough and he ran into the bathroom, probably to puke some more. Me, on the other hand, I was just too curious to stop. So I popped in the fourth tape and holy shit. At first, it was just all black until the lens cap was removed and what was revealed I can only describe as if you threw Hannibal Lecter a birthday party. Entrails hung from the walls like party streams. Both fresh and dried blood was smeared all around a Jackson Pellick painting. And that symbol, the same one that was on the tapes, was painted in most likely blood on the wall. There was a table in the center of a room with organs, hearts, kidneys and other insides circled around it. And in the center of the table, held down by rope and shackles, was the man from tape number one. He was beaten badly. Bruises and cuts completely covered his body, and his eyes had been removed. Definitely not by a surgeon. The left one had been completely ripped out. As I was trying to keep down my lunch, the same masked men entered the room, this time joined by four other figures. Two I could make out as female, the other two I couldn't be too sure about. They all circled the man as they each picked up one of the still beating hearts at their feet. The one I assumed to be their leader, a man with a ram skull that had been carved into a mask with one deer antler replacing the original curled horn and was dressed in a dark red cloak, had begun reciting some kind of scripture, 
something in a language I could not understand. But one part was said in English. It went as follows. The tainted blood spills for the pure to thrive. After finishing their speech, they lifted their cloaks, all pulling out blades of various shapes and sizes. All with that same symbol carved into the base of the blades. They began butchering this poor man, who thrived in pain, screaming for help. They began removing his limbs before tearing into his insides. The sickest, most disturbing thing was that no matter what they did, he remained alive throughout it all. It wasn't until they ripped the man's heart out that he finally stopped moving. Once the leader had removed the heart, they all held them up to the sky once again, and chanting, the tainted blood must spill, before biting deep into the hearts. That's when I finally had enough. I removed the tape, and I threw them all into the box before bringing them down to the basement, and setting them all on fire. I didn't even bother with the fifth one, At least, I tried not to. After watching them burn to a crisp, I returned to my room, only to see that fifth tape sitting on my nightstand. It was smoking and crackling with some burn marks, but still intact. I lost my shit, and I began bashing it to pieces with a hammer, till it was nothing more than a powder. I stayed up all night, making sure this thing didn't return again, but I eventually crashed due to lack of sleep and complete shock. As I'm sure you've guessed already, I woke up in the morning to find that tape sitting on the VHS player. I came to the conclusion that it was not going to go away until I watched it. So I did just that. And holy shit, I wish I never did. The video started out as normal, but with a shot of my home city. How did I know that it was my home city? Well, because the video was recorded on our street. The camera slowly turned and pointed at my apartment building before zooming into my room, where I saw, I saw, me. I looked up at the timestamp on the video. It was 20 minutes before I had first gone up into that attic. Here is the truth as I know. There are things that exist in this world that cannot be explained. And just because you don't believe in something, that doesn't mean it can't hurt you. I had heard tales of the trail for years. Every old time hiker I ran into, they had a story about their time on the trail. How they were just dropped into it without any warning and they were never the same again. Most of the time, they barely made it out with their lives. A bunch of weed cooked up bullshit, I thought. It wasn't bullshit, though. I found myself on the trail this past July and it was their stories that kept me alive. I've spoken to no one about this before. I don't want to be known as that hiker guy that others walk into the poison ivy to avoid. But more and more people are going out, which means the trail is going to pick some of them, and they are going to go in unprepared. The trail doesn't suffer idiots or newbies. It 
eats them. First of all, know that the trail takes who it wants, when it wants, from wherever it wants. If you're going out, even for a day hike, make sure you bring enough supplies to last at least three nights. That's the average time the trail takes to get through, according to most of those that survived. This means food, water, shelter. You're not going to realize you're on the trail until you're already deep in it, so there is no going back, no restocking. Listen very carefully to this next part. Do not take anything from the trail unless it is given or offered to you. Water is fine to take from the streams. Food, if your only other option is to die, because it's probably going to kill you anyway. There are signs that you are on the trail. If you feel something's amiss, look for them. The first one that just about everyone mentions is the map stand. It's just sitting there in the middle of a fork in the trail. You won't miss it, because it'll be the cleanest damn thing you've ever seen in the woods. Not a lick of dirt or water damage on any of the pamphlets. As if Gorn himself had just dropped the stupid thing there moments before you came upon it. Do not take one. Pretend it's not there if you have to. But do not take a map. Remember, take nothing. Not unless it is given or offered. Past the map stand, you'll probably come across more of the pamphlets littering the ground. These, I think, were left behind by those who did not follow the advice above. You'll be curious to know why they're all there. I was. But the best option here is to just walk into the bush and continue on. If you're feeling brave, you can look up. I don't recommend that though. I still have nightmares. Stay in the bush until you reach a cross-shaped tree with a little rag doll nailed to the front. As you near the tree, the nail will fall and the doll will tumble onto the path. Pick the doll up. This counts as being given. Here, you can get back onto the dirt path, and you stick to that path like glue for the rest of the day. There is a little girl in a dirty nightgown that will follow you from off that trail. The doll is hers. She will cry. She will beg for you to give it back. Put the doll in your pack and ignore her. She'll disappear when you reach the creek. When you make it to the creek, cross at the shallowest part. The water plays tricks, and it is much deeper than it looks. There is an undercurrent that can easily pull you down to the bottom. The woman who told me about the current, she barely made it out, and she is now deathly afraid of water. She said that it's not just the current, but there are things down there, things that grab you. I didn't ask her what she meant by things. This is it for the first day. Keep on hiking until it gets dark. Don't worry about your pace. Darkness will settle in when you reach a certain point. Make sure you bring a headlamp as you'll probably want to go 15 minutes further after dark. For me, I could hear footsteps on the trail a few meters behind me, and I went the extra 15 minutes and those sounds stopped. I don't know what will happen if you set up camp with the footsteps still following behind you. If it is a cold night, 
keep your fire as small as possible. One guy I spoke to, he made a large fire on the first night, thinking that it would keep anything dangerous away. He's now missing an arm. The next day, wake up with the sun. Electronic devices don't really work on the trail, and if they do, they cannot be trusted, so don't rely on your phone's alarm. You probably won't sleep well the first night anyway. The dogs will keep you awake with their howls and their barks. They're feasting on something, something that cries out every once in a while. Don't go looking for it. Stick to the trail for at least two kilometers. After that, the trail will split. I don't have a definitive answer on which way to go. Some people have had five ways show up. Some, only two. Choose the one that you think is the best. Just keep in mind that on the trail, not everything is as it seems. From here, things will probably be different for you, depending on which trail you picked. It's now down to a bit of luck and using your head. For me, the trail almost cleaned me on that split. It showed me a family member. They were hurt. Stupidly, I tended to them, and I got a knife in my backpack for it. I never killed anything before, let alone someone that was the spitting image of my little brother. You'll come out on the other side of the split. Some hikers, they have tried multiple trails of the split. One told me that they got out on the second day by doing this. The rest of them wished that they had just kept going forward. Just as the sun is setting, you'll notice a fire off the side of the trail. A woman will be sitting by it, stoking it with a branding iron. She will offer for you to join her. I got the impression that not doing so would be a very bad idea. So I would suggest you do the same and sit. Stay as long as you are able and do not look bored. She branded my forearm for yawning. It burns terribly whenever I think of the trail. She will offer you food. It's not bad, so just eat it. Once finished, you can get up and she'll only watch you silently as you return to the trail. Continue on until you reach the briar patch. This briar patch, it stretches on for what seems like kilometers in either direction. The only way to move forward is to go right through. The thorns change the farther you go, and if you aren't wearing long sleeves and pants, then you're going to be torn up before you make it halfway. That's when the thorns change completely to what look like little mouths. They dart out from behind leaves, bell-shaped things, colored yellow and purple. They are like leeches, and they will attach to you. Remove them as fast as you can, or you're probably not going to make it out. Be careful, as they will sometimes squirt your blood back at you, and being blinded by it, that will only make getting out harder. The last thing on the third day is probably the easiest and the hardest thing. You should come to a house in the middle of the woods. I heard crying from it. Others hear screams or strange moaning voices. Remember that doll from earlier. This is what you need it for. There will not be a trail anywhere in sight, and entering the woods, that will just bring you back to the house. 
For me, the front door was blocked, as were the windows, which left the open basement doors as my only option. Through the basement, I found strange items from hanging knives to children's toys. Somewhere, a record player plays only static. I found the stairs to the first floor, following the crying. It led me to the second floor, and to a door that was shut tight. Using my shoulder to open it, I found a burned out room. The wooden walls and the floor still had embers glowing. There was a heat haze that burned my throat as I breathed. Sitting in the center of that room was a tiny cradle and the girl that had appeared off the trail. She stared at me, eyes just as hot as the embers in that room. She looked almost devilish as she sat there, rocking the cradle slowly. The heat in that room, it was growing by the second. All the cuts and nicks from the sticker bushes itched and burned, and I wiped sweat from my forehead as I looked around the room. It got so bad that I could feel the soles of my boots becoming soft. I didn't know what she wanted, until I remembered that doll. I dug it out of my pack, and I placed it gently into the cradle. As I straightened, I found myself back on the trail again. A light breeze drying the sweat from my skin. This may not be the same thing that happens to you, but... It seems to me, she just wants the doll. On the final day, there is only one thing left to be worried about. You'll eventually come to a clearing, covered in a red substance that I can only assume is blood, but it bubbles on the bushes and the tall grasses. This is not the strangest bit. At the end of the clearing... There will be a mirror, at least 10 feet wide and 6 feet high. As you approach, you should see two reflections in the mirror. One of them, it follows you, as it should. The second will just be standing there, waiting for you. It'll do nothing at first, at least mine didn't. But as soon as I was level with it, I felt the coldness of metal against my neck. In a flash, the strange reflection had moved to behind me, and in his hand was a blade. He spoke, but I could not hear the words. It took a few seconds to understand what he was saying. You see, on the mirror are words that you have to say out loud. It will be your deepest, darkest secret, or at least one of them. It may be something utterly terrible, something that scares you, something you may not have even been consciously aware of. Your reflection will demand that you say this out loud. Do it. The knife at your throat should be enough warning not to test this mirror. If you pass this test, then the mirror, it should become transparent. Walk up to it and step through. That's it. Your journey should now be complete. Pray that your trip on the trail was as short as mine. Every story I've heard ends with the mirror. But that's not to say that others who didn't make it out didn't have other experiences. This isn't a list of everything, only things I've experienced myself and heard from others. The trail changes you, and you could face all of these things, or none of these. Be careful if you still decide to go hiking. I, for one, will be staying away from trails from now on. 
all of them. We always expect life to be easier than it actually is. Why is that? Why do we assume that we are owed happiness? Why do we act so surprised when things go wrong? Is it this society we live in? Is it the false advertising that surrounds us at all times? Is it because of the things we watch or the books we read? Why is tragedy always so shocking? Life is a slog of disappointment and misery. Sometimes we are graced with pockets of joy, brief respite from all the hardship. In these moments, we feel like we have figured out the purpose of our existence. Love, family, culture, travel, natural beauty. But it's all bullshit. Those fleeting hours of contentment They are nothing more than a quick breath between beatings. It's a ray of hope that gets stuck inside our minds like a cancer. We hold on to it. We beg for it. We scream for it. During times of unbearable mental agony, having something to hope for is actually worse than if there was no hope at all. Hope is a lie. It is a disease that tricks our minds into thinking this painful reality is going to evaporate like a puff of breath on a cold wind. Let me assure you, reality is a brutal, bloody corpse. Now, you might be reading this and thinking, I'm not like this. I have a good life, a healthy family. I'm financially secure. Let me tell you this. I hope you enjoy your quick breath of clean air, because there is a bomb falling over your head. You may not see it yet, but it is descending at a tremendous speed. When you least expect it, it's going to land and devastate your entire existence. It will destroy everything you love, and it will leave you broken, weeping in the gutter. Why am I telling you this? Why should you listen to me? Because the bomb has already dropped on me. Because the fallout is unbearable. And I cannot seem to find a gasp of clean air in this toxic wasteland of life. My throat burns. My eyes water. And I can't speak for fear of tearing my silent throat. My wife is dead. She died a year ago, and she left me alone to raise our little girl, Heather. Heather is all I have left. She is the gas mask that I struggle to hold on to. She is the choked cries of desperation I emit from between bloody teeth. Heather is five now. We did our best to recover from the pain of my wife's death. A loss of a companion a removal of a mother. I shudder to think my daughter has to face the bloody blade of life at such a young age. She needs to be sheltered from it. She needs protection. And for a while, I thought that I was providing that. But that was before. That was before the nightmares started. That was before the tall dog. I scrubbed the sleep from my eyes, rolling in the darkness to check the clock. 3 a.m. I groaned and pulled myself from the warmth of my sheets. Heather was crying from her room, calling my name. She must have had a bad dream. In a daze, blinking sleepily, I shuffled out of my room and down to hers. The house was silent and my feet scuffed over the cool hardwood floors. Heather never has bad dreams, I thought, yawning. 
did I let her watch something scary before bed? I entered her room. The space was illuminated by a pink ballerina nightlight. I went over to my daughter's side. She was curled up in a ball with her hands over her face. She was sniffling and her pillow felt damp with tears. Cooing, I scooped her up and told her that everything was okay. After she calmed down some, I asked her if she had had a nightmare. She looked up at me with big, teary eyes and she nodded. She hugged me and she asked if she could sleep in my bed. I told her, of course. It won't come into your room? Heather asked me as I picked us both up off the bed. I paused. Sweetie, what are you talking about? She wrapped herself tightly around me and she whispered into my ear. The tall dog. I didn't know what to make of it. The phrase was nonsense and so I just told her that there were no dogs coming into the house and that we were safe. I felt her relax against me as I walked us back to my bedroom. I laid her down in my bed and stroked her hair until I heard the soft snores of sleep. I laid down next to her and exhaled heavily. Sleep suddenly returned to me in a rush of heavy fatigue. The next day, life resumed its predictable repetition. I got Heather ready for school and then rushed to prepare myself for work. I left her downstairs in front of the television, happily munching on some toast as I scurried to shower and shave. It was like this every morning, but I was used to the frantic pace. As I threw my sports jacket on and bustled into the hallway to go downstairs, I paused. I bent down and wet my thumb with my tongue. I scrubbed it along the hardwood floor, wiping away a streak of dirt that ran towards Heather's room. I grit my teeth, reminding myself that it's not a big deal. She was only five years old and she couldn't be expected to remember to take off her shoes every time. Standing, I hurried down the stairs and collected my daughter to begin our day. I switched off the TV and grabbed Heather's pink Barbie backpack, asking her if she had to go to the bathroom before school. When she said she didn't, I snatched the car keys off the kitchen counter and ushered her to the front door. As I followed Heather out, I hesitated. My hand froze before I closed the door all the way. I stuck my head back inside and listened. I could have sworn that I'd heard something from upstairs. After a second, I just shrugged it off and closed the door, locking it tight. The day passed like so many before it. The hands on the clock pushed forward triumphantly and finally announced the end of the workday. Not long after the trumpets of freedom were blown, I found myself at home once again. I decided to order pizza for us, a rare delicacy to my daughter, and we spent the evening watching children's shows on Netflix. I barely saw the images on the screen, the fatigue from the day washing over me in heavy waves. A stomach full of pizza, that didn't help either. Heather shifted and snuggled into me, resting her head against my chest. I smiled and kissed her shoulder, telling her that after this episode, it was time for bed. She put up her usual resistance, but I battled it valiantly. That was something I had to learn how to do. My wife has always been the one who knew how to say no and knew when to say enough was enough. I was always the softy, allowing Heather to get away with a multitude of activities. It was just so hard to say no to her big, cute brown eyes, brimming with innocent pleas. 
My dad heart, it melted every time, and I would eventually cave, begging her to not tell her mother. But after the brain tumor took my wife away from us, I had to learn how to balance my daughter's requests with fatherly affection and parental standards. I thought I'd found a reasonable balance. With each passing day, I would discover another piece of this mad puzzle and take another step closer to becoming a functional single parent. When the show ended, I told Heather to run upstairs and brush her teeth and get ready for bed. Groaning, she eventually obeyed and I began to pick up the kitchen. I placed our plates in the dishwasher and threw out the empty pizza box. I checked my watch and saw that it was almost 11. I sighed. I hadn't realized it had gotten this late. I should have put Heather to bed two hours ago. I exhaled. I guess it wasn't the end of the world. After the kitchen was clean, I turned off all the lights and made sure the front door was locked. Satisfied, I climbed the stairs and I went to check on Heather's progress. To my delight, I found her already in bed and asleep. I went to her and gently kissed the top of her head, smiling to myself. She really was a good girl. I turned on her nightlight and closed her door behind me. I went to my own room and prepared myself for bed. As I slid into the cool sheets, I decided that tomorrow after school, I would take Heather to the park so she could ride her bike along the community bike trail. Content with my plans, I closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep. Darkness. Haze. Groggy. Slowly, I peeled my eyes back open in the black. Head spinning. Why was I awake? What time was it? I rolled over and looked at the clock. 3am. I blinked and closed my eyes, deep drowsiness filling my body like hard liquor. That's when I noticed it. Heather was crying. I forced my eyes open again. This must be why I woke up. I pulled myself into a sitting position and scrubbed my face with the palms of my hands. Why was she crying? Another nightmare? As I stood, I prayed that this was not going to turn into a regular thing. I stumbled around in the darkness and pulled my door open. I stepped out into the hall and I paused, cocking my head towards the stairs. I thought I heard something moving down there. Another wave of cries from Heather's room forced me back into motion and I shuffled down the hall, opening her door. The room was bathed in soft pink light, the tiny ballerina illuminating the walls with her glowing body. I went to my daughter and I knelt by her bed, whispering softly that daddy was here and everything was okay. She wrapped her arms around my neck and she hugged me tight, soft sniffles escaping her bubbly nose. I stroked her hair and I asked her if she had another nightmare. She pulled away from me and looked up, her eyes brimming with tears. Yes, Daddy, it was awful, she cried. And, and when I woke up, she trailed off, struggling to get herself under control. My eyes melted. What? What is it, sweetie? When I woke up, the tall dog was whispering in my ear, she sobbed, collapsing against me. I felt my stomach churn slightly. Prickles of unease rose along my arms like tiny mountains of fleshy fear. This would be the second night in a row that Heather mentioned this tall dog. I didn't know what the hell she was talking about, what it was, 
but clearly it was bothering her. I wondered if perhaps someone at school had told her something or she'd seen something scary on TV about a dog. Whatever it was, it was giving my daughter nightmares and I needed to find a way to make it stop. Suddenly, Heather squeezed my neck and I heard her gasp. Before I could react, she buried her face against me and started sobbing even harder, her whole body shaking now. Confused, I pulled her off me and cupped her face in my hands. What is it? What's wrong? I asked urgently. Heather pointed behind me towards the open door. It just peeked around the corner and it was looking at you. I spun around, my heart thundering. There was nothing there. Of course there was nothing there. Why would there be? Putting a hand over my chest, I forced myself to settle down. There's nothing there, honey. It's just shadows. It's late. Do you want to sleep in my bed again? Her eyes remained locked on the open door as she slowly nodded. I picked her up and rubbed her back as I walked us out of her room. There was nothing to be afraid of. She had just had a bad dream. As I walked down the hallway, I paused in the darkness. I looked to my right, down the stairs, down into the gaping moor of black. Did I hear something moving down there? Heather squeezed me tight, and she whispered into my ear, It's going into the basement. I shifted her weight in my arms, her words sending a shiver of unease down my spine. I told her again, there was nothing there. I brought her into my room and tucked her into bed. I sat beside her, rubbed her head until she drifted off to sleep. It took longer than it had the previous night, but once she was breathing easy, I went to my bedroom door and stepped out into the hall. In the dead of night, when surrounded by heavy darkness, fear has a way of making monsters out of the shadows. I forced myself to remain calm, reminded myself that I was an adult, and I went and stood at the top of the stairs. I looked down, the enclosed staircase revealing nothing but the square black mouth at the bottom. I listened, holding my breath. Silence. I shook my head. I told myself that I was being ridiculous and I went back into my room. I closed the door and I lay down next to my daughter. I stared up at the ceiling, mind alert and awake. I knew that I was not going to be falling asleep anytime soon. I pulled my phone off the nightstand and I brought up the web browser. After taking a moment to think, I plugged in the search term, tall dog. I scrolled on past some dog show sites that popped up and, finally, found a link to a message board. I tapped on it. My heart skipped a beat as I read the question at the top. It read as follows. My son keeps having nightmares and complains about something called the tall dog. Does anyone know what the hell this is? It's happened three nights in a row. It's driving me crazy. Please help. The top answer, right below it, sent a chill rocketing through my body. It read, Your son is telling the truth. Get help. The tall dog is real, and it will keep coming back. It's attracted to deep sadness, and it will not leave your son alone until it gets what it wants. It is very dangerous. I know this sounds insane, but I am telling you the truth. I've come across others who have encountered this thing, 
It is very real and very dangerous. I put my phone down and I stared into the darkness. My heart was racing. This couldn't be true, could it? Every part of me wanted to write it off as a bizarre coincidence. But it was so specific that I just couldn't. What am I supposed to do with this information? I thought. This is crazy. Stuff like this doesn't happen. Stuff like this doesn't exist. And yet here I was, staring at a warning on my phone while my terrified daughter lay curled up next to me. It was unnerving. I turned onto my side and I stared at the closed bedroom door. Just outside the door were the stairs leading to the ground level. As I closed my eyes, I pictured something long and lanky pulling itself up them, its snout dragging along the wood. I forced that image out of my head and I shivered. There was nothing out there. The next day, Heather didn't mention anything about the nightmares, and I didn't ask her. I wanted all this to go away, and bringing it up in the daylight didn't seem like that would help my cause. I prepared her for school and then got myself ready for work. As we left the house, I realised just how tired I was. The lack of sleep last night... It was taking its toll on me. I made a mental note to stop and get more coffee after I dropped Heather off. Whilst I drove, my mind wandered back to the message board warning. In the daylight, it seemed a bit silly. I pushed the fear back into the corner of my mind and I scolded myself internally for being so irrational. I reminded myself again that I was an adult and I didn't believe in monsters and things that go bump in the night. After I dropped Heather off at school, I went back and got another cup of coffee and then drove to work. My brain accepted the caffeine gratefully and as I sipped on the steaming liquid, I pondered what my wife would make of this whole thing. She would probably say I was being stupid and to man up. The thought made me grin, and suddenly, I found myself missing her. Eventually, I pulled into the office parking lot and began my day. Being Friday, I was hoping that I could leave a bit early. The crisp morning air, a prelude to a possible beautiful day. I still planned on taking Heather to the park. I had hopes that the fresh air and the sunshine might erase her nightmares, burning them away in a blaze of brilliance. Well, things didn't go as planned. Halfway through the day, I got a call from Heather's school. I sat, dumbfounded as the principal explained to me that I needed to come and pick up my daughter. When I asked him why, he informed me that Heather had started biting her classmates and wouldn't stop until a teacher forcefully pulled her off another kid. I closed my open mouth, shock erupting across my face. There had to be some kind of mistake. My daughter didn't do things like that. The principal assured me that he was just as surprised as I was. But, nonetheless, she needed to be taken home for the day. The other kids were scared of her, and the parents were being notified. Great, I thought. I'll be the single dad with the violent child. As soon as that thought popped into my mind... I got angry with myself. Who cares what they think? I need to go see if my daughter is okay. 
I informed my boss of the phone call and he nodded me out the door. I thanked him and told him I'd make it up on Monday before bolting for my car. As I drove, I tried to make sense as to the possible reasons why Heather would act out like this. She wouldn't just do it. One of the kids, they must be picking on her. One of them must have provoked her. She wouldn't just start biting kids. I sat there at a red light, anxiously drumming my fingers against the wheel. Something was going on with my daughter, and I needed to get to the bottom of it. First, the nightmares, and now this. Clearly, Heather was going through something, and as a responsible parent, I needed to find out what it was. I grit my teeth as the light finally turned green and I gunned the engine. I wondered if this had something to do with my wife. I wondered if this was Heather's way of coming to terms with her death over a year later. I felt my eyes suddenly well up and my knuckles turned white. It wasn't fair. It was not fair that she had been taken from us. Why? What had we done to deserve such sadness? What was going through Heather's young mind in the absence of her mother? What could I do to fill that sorrow? Then, I started to panic. The creeping thoughts of Heather's upcoming teenage years. What if this was the end of our good relationship? What if she started blaming me for her mum's death? I knew she was only five, but time has a way of preserving deep hurt and forming scars that never heal. I realised just how much I needed to be there for my daughter in these early years, these crucial development times. How I acted, that could make or break the way she viewed, well, everything. As these thoughts scrambled my mind, I pulled into the school parking lot, and as I did, I was slammed with a realisation, one that chilled me to the bone. I remembered the message board warning. The tall dog, it is attracted to deep sadness. I shook my head. No, don't start going down that road. That's... Insane. There's no such thing. She's forming waking nightmares in order to deal with what she's going through. Stealing myself, I ran into the school. Before I knew it, I was sitting in the principal's office, listening to him apologize for making such a big deal out of this, and that it was more for the other kids than for Heather. I barely heard him nodding as his words washed over me in waves of numb noise. Finally, a teacher led Heather into the room and I scooped her up in a big hug. I kissed her on the cheek and I saw that she had been crying. I told her that I loved her and that we were going home. She nodded silently at me, her big, brown eyes filling with tears. I told the teacher and the principal that I was sorry for the incident and I assured them it would not happen again. They both smiled and they thanked me. But I saw something else behind their masks of public decency. I saw judgment. They saw me as a single father with no idea how to raise a little girl. They saw a struggling man with no answers they saw someone who had lost his wife and was still finding a way to live without her. Suddenly, I got angry. A spike of adrenaline coursing through my veins, but I kept my mouth shut. I turned and I left, hugging my daughter close to me as I stormed out of the school. I didn't know if it was righteous anger or embarrassment and I did not care. They had no idea 
what I had gone through, what I was dealing with. Who the hell were they to judge me? I put Heather in the car and I drove us home in silence. I fought to get myself under control. I reminded myself that this wasn't about me, it was about my daughter. She was the one who needed help. She was the one who needed loving support. We eventually arrived home and I checked my watch. It was almost four. I abandoned the idea of going to the park and instead sat Heather down on the couch. I placed myself next to her and I told her that we needed to talk about what happened at school. Sweetie, are you doing okay? I asked her gently, gauging her mental state. She looked down at her hands and nodded. I cleared my throat. I was always so bad at this. Is it true you bit those kids today? I saw her lip quiver and she slowly nodded without looking up at me. I sighed. Honey, you can't bite people. You know that, right? Why did you bite those kids? She shrugged again, and I saw a tear rolling down her cheek. Be brave, I told myself. You can't back out now. Were you mad at them? Did someone say something mean to you? She put one hand in her pocket and slowly shook her head, eyes still downcast. Heather, can you look at me? I asked softly. She turned her eyes to mine, and I saw she was crying openly now. She kept on fidgeting in her pocket. Honey, can you promise me that you won't do it again? I asked. More tears ran down her cheeks, and she cried. I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm really sorry. I leaned down and kissed her on the head. It's okay, honey. I know you're a good girl. Daddy loves you very much. Just please don't bite anyone again, okay? She sniffled back another outburst of tears, and her hand, it kept on twisting in her pocket. I finally noticed, and I patted her leg. What's in your pocket, Heather? Do you have something you want to show me? She suddenly looked embarrassed and shook her head. But I prodded her, and after some coaching, she finally pulled out a handful of brown nuggets. I blinked, wondering why my daughter was carrying around a pocket full of dirt. And then my heart slammed so hard against my ribcage, I thought it would break. Sweetie, I said trying to keep my voice under control. Is... is that dog food? She balled her fist up, and she hunked the nuggets to her chest, staring at her feet that dangled from the edge of the couch. Where did you get that? I asked, feeling a deep disturbance roll over me. I found them, she answered quietly. And what are you doing with them in your pocket? I asked, a flurry of nerves fluttering in my chest. Heather looked up at me. They taste good. I forced myself to breathe and held out my hand. Why don't you let me hang on to those and I'll make us an early dinner, okay? Reluctantly, she handed over the nuggets and I plastered a smile to my face. I asked her if she wanted to watch some TV while I made us dinner, and she offered me a small grin and nodded sheepishly. As I turned on her shows, I fought with the voice screaming in my head. Something was going on here. Something really, really awful was happening to my daughter. I didn't know what exactly. But the past couple of days seemed to mark a turning point in her behavior. I started preparing dinner, 
begging myself to stop overreacting. But I couldn't shut it out. The nightmares, the tall dog nonsense, the biting, and now she was eating dog food? I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say to her. I wanted to ask her about her mother, ask her if she'd been thinking about her recently, but I was afraid to. I didn't want to open up a wound I couldn't close. What if she started asking questions I couldn't answer? What if her behavior got worse? I began to wonder if I needed to take her to a therapist. As the thought entered my mind, I violently slammed the door on it. There was nothing wrong with my daughter. She was just a vibrant little girl who had a few nightmares and bit a couple of kids. So what? When I was her age, I'm sure I did things much worse and I turned out fine. Yes, but what about the tall dog? What does that mean? I shouted internally at myself to stop thinking about it. There was no such thing, and I needed to face the problems I could handle. I finished making dinner in mental agony, and I prepared two plates. I went to the couch and sat with Heather, both of us eating in silence as cartoon images danced on the screen. I suddenly thought back to what Heather had said the other night. When I woke up, the tall dog was whispering in my ear. I grit my teeth around my food. I was not thinking about this bullshit anymore. I crawled into bed, mentally exhausted. It had taken me forever to get Heather to sleep. She had begged to sleep in my bed, but I told her no and that I'd keep my door open just in case she woke up scared. I just didn't want her to start forming bad habits. I rested my head against my pillow, and I stared out into the dark hallway from the crack in my door. I shut my eyes, and I said a silent prayer that Heather might sleep through the night. Maybe then, all of this would be over, and she would go back to being the little angel I knew she was. I didn't want to continue down this road of parental speculation and continue assuming that every little bad action was a foretelling of a bleak future for her. I let out a long breath, and I waited for the gentle arms of sleep to rock me into the world of dreams. It didn't take long. My eyes snapped open, bloodshot and wide. I was soaked in sweat, the horrific nightmare still clinging to my brain with razor-sharp claws. I rolled onto my back and I wiped the sweat from my face. I swallowed hard and I waited for reality to clear away the cobwebs of slumber. My heart was racing and I put a hand over my bare chest, willing it to slow. My wife. I had been dreaming about my wife. She'd been in a hospital bed, screaming my name, clutching her head. I'd been beside her, crying, begging her to just tell me what was wrong, but she just kept screaming. I began to scream for a doctor, and that's when I realized all the lights in the hospital were off and no one was in the halls. I kept screaming for help, pleading with my wife, until finally I heard a noise. From the blackness of the hall, a doctor in a bloody lab coat came crawling into the room on all fours. His eyes, they were wild, and he started barking at me, his mouth foaming. I backed away from him, shock and terror rising in me like a dark mountain. The doctor lunged at me, teeth bared, and that was when I woke up. I pulled my hands across my face, forcing the images from my head. 
what a horrible nightmare. I realized my stressed mind was probably mixing all my current worries into one terrifying nighttime cocktail, sneaking up on me and pouring it down my throat while I slept. I looked over at the clock. 3 a.m. I snorted, eyes wide, grateful that at least it was me instead of Heather who had woken up tonight. If I could take her fears from her, I would, gladly. I just needed to be careful I didn't end up burning myself out. As I rolled onto my side to face my door, I heard something downstairs. Immediately, my mind exploded into alertness, the nightmare fear still fresh on my breath. I lay there in the silence, ear cocked, listening, my heart racing. There it was. It sounded like something was walking around. Get up. You have to get up, I thought to myself. Fear tingling my stomach. It's probably nothing. It's probably the house settling. Maybe Heather got up for some reason. Or maybe she's sleepwalking. I pulled the covers off me and I swung my feet over the side of the bed. I jumped as I heard more movement. What is going on? Tense and terrifyingly nervous, I crept up to the door. I paused, staring out into the empty hallway. I didn't hear anything. Slowly, I opened the door and went out into the hallway. Something was making noise at the bottom of the stairs. I balled my sweaty hands into fists and I steeled myself. The house was impossibly dark. Every corner filled with grinning black. The floor underneath my feet creaked as I slowly edged myself over to the top of the stairs. I looked down there and something looked back up at me. I stifled a scream, terror clenching my throat like an iron grip. My eyes bulged, and my breath rushed from my lungs in a wave of cold fear. It was long and slender, its hairless body a sickly grey colour. It looked like a dog, but it was greater in length and bone thin. Its snout pointed up at me from the foot of the stairs, easily two feet in length. Its eyes were completely white and swollen in their sockets, like bloated marshmallows. It was on all fours, its front two legs resting on the first two steps. As it gazed up at me, it began to pull itself upright. My knees turned to liquid and I watched in absolute horror as it rose to stand on two legs, its head towering towards the ceiling. Its neck was long, too long for a dog, and it snarled up at me, its mouth full of black, needle-like teeth. It started slowly walking up the stairs towards me. I backed away in frantic desperation, unable to comprehend what I was looking at. I tripped over my own feet and fell, not able to tear my eyes away from the advancing monstrosity. As it neared the top of the stairs, it crouched back down on all fours, and I saw its swollen white eyes pulsing with excitement. I tried to scream, but I found that I didn't have the breath. This was the most terrifying thing I had ever seen, and every alarm in my head was blaring with furious urgency. I scooted backwards with my hands into the safety of my room, and I stood, grabbing the door and slamming it shut in one violent gesture. I stood, 
with my back against the wood, sucking in hungry lungfuls of air. What in the hell was that thing? What was it doing in my house? Where had it come from? Heather. Oh no. Heather. I pressed my ear to the door, and I heard footsteps padding down the hallway towards Heather's room. I scrambled in the dark for some kind of weapon. Grabbing my discarded work pants that were lying in a pile on the floor, I slid the belt from the loops. I wrapped it around my knuckles, turning the buckle outwards. I pressed against the closed door, and I took a deep breath. I could not let that thing hurt my daughter. I opened the door and stepped out into the dark hall. My eyes scanned my surroundings, but I couldn't see it. I knew it had to be in Heather's room. Cautiously, I crept down the hall. My ears trained to pick up any sound of this thing. Heather's door was wide open, and a faint pink light drifted out from the inside. I entered her room and froze. The monster, the tall dog, was on all fours by Heather's bed. Its snout was inches from her ear, and its mouth moved rapidly. I couldn't hear any noise, though. It was like it was speaking directly into her dream. Heather's eyes were shut, but she had begun to stir, soft cries escaping her lips as the tall dog silently filled her mind. Suddenly, it realized I was in the room and it whipped its head around. Its eyes seemed to vibrate in their sockets, thick, white pus leaking from them. It silently bared its teeth, its mouth filling with sharp, ebony darkness. I took a step back, feeling my throat tighten, and I gripped the belt harder in my hand. I needed to get it away from Heather. My heart was seizing in my chest, and my back was coated in a cold layer of sweat. I forced my knees to lock, and I licked my dry lips. The tall dog turned away from the bed, and it rose up on two legs, towering over me. Despite its appearance, it did not move like an animal. Its balance was perfect, and its legs and muscles twisted and flowed with the confidence of a human. What do you want? I whispered, holding my ground as a trickle of sweat slid down my face. It then leapt at me. I screamed, raising my hands to protect my face as its long body crashed into mine. I fell to the floor, its sinewy flesh pressing mine to the wood. Its breath was hot on my face, and stars exploded across my vision, my head bouncing on the ground. With the energy battered out of me, I blinked back darkness and scrambled desperately, trying to get it off me. It pinned me where I lay, its powerful legs digging into my sides. I looked up into its hideous face, and the white ooze pouring from its eyes dripped into my hair. It leaned down, and it opened its mouth, its jaws parting to reveal rows and rows of black teeth. I watched in horror as its throat began to open, folds of dark flesh parting like oil and water. And then I heard my daughter screaming from deep down inside. Daddy, help me, please. Don't let it take me. Daddy, please. Heather's voice was shrill with panic and it sent waves of chilling terror through my body. No, this wasn't happening. That wasn't my daughter. It couldn't be. Please, God. No. The tall dog snapped its jaws shut 
and I shoved it off me, a surge of energy igniting my muscles. It skittered on all fours towards the open door, and I scrambled to stand, breathing heavily. What did you do to her? I screamed, shaking in fear and fury. What have you done to my daughter? The tall dog crouched and eyed me, sniffing the air. I waited for it to strike, waited for it to move. This thing was going to kill me. I knew that, but I was ready. I stood my ground in the dim light, trembling, accepting whatever happened next. Instead of charging me though, it turned away and sprinted down the hall. In shock, I listened to it crash down the stairs and onto the ground floor. More footsteps followed and then faded away. I realized it was gone, leaving me shaking in horror. I turned to Heather, who lay motionless on the bed. I threw the belt onto the floor and went to her side, prayers flowing from my lips. Tears leaked down my cheeks as I grabbed Heather and lifted her head to rest on my lap. Her eyes were closed and her body was still. Please, God, I'm begging you. No, no, no. My mind was absolutely collapsing. Heather, my angel, wake up. Daddy's here. Please, please wake up. I shook her, pleading as reality tore my exhausted brain in two. Suddenly, her eyes flickered and then she opened them. She stared up at me, blinking rapidly as if she wasn't sure where she was. I let out a cry of raw relief and I hugged her tight against me, more tears pouring from my eyes. I sobbed, rocking back and forth on the bed, clutching her to my chest. I thought that I had lost her. I thought that she had been taken away from me. And then Heather began to bark. My bloodshot eyes widened and I pulled her away to look at her face. Her eyes roamed around the room, curiously, and her tongue lolled from the side of her mouth. Drool leaked from her lips as she sat upon my lap, panting. She finally looked up at me and let out a series of yaps, all signs of humanity draining from her eyes. Heather, stop it! Stop that! I cried, shaking her. Don't do that! It's okay! It's gone, sweetie! But she didn't stop. She jumped from my arms, and she began to run in circles, as if she were chasing an imaginary tail. She stopped where she was, and cocked her head at me, shouting a sharp bark, as if she wanted me to play with her. I sat on the bed, watching her, and gripped my face with sweaty hands, and I began to scream. Heather will never be the same. That night, I rushed her to the hospital and I begged the doctors for help. After examining her and bringing in a multitude of specialists, they informed me that she was not in control of her mind anymore. They told me that she would never regain it. Something had been taken from her that night, something that could not be replaced or repaired. I don't know how long they ran tests on her, as I desperately expended all my options, desperate to try anything. I simply couldn't imagine a life without her. I couldn't imagine a life alone from her. I wept and I prayed until I had nothing left to offer. Nothing changed, nothing helped, and I wondered if anyone even noticed. You see, 
Life is an unflinching monster. It doesn't care about you. It doesn't take your side. It simply is. It took my wife away, and it opened up a wound in my daughter's mind. A wound I didn't even have the courage to ask my daughter if even existed. Something horrible had caught scent of that gaping wound. Something had grown hungry for it. It had entered our life and slipped into the gory cracks of my daughter's hidden, suppressed sadness. It had replaced her mind with its own, and it had devoured the fractured remains of a confused and hurt psyche. And I know now that I have lost Heather forever to it. So now I stand here, in the darkness, over my daughter's bed. I grip the pillow with shaking hands. Tears roll down my face, and I beg God to forgive me. But whatever is laying in this bed, I know that it is not my daughter. Marcy found a flash drive under the mattress when she was changing the sheets on Emma's bed. We both found this quite odd. Why was our five-year-old daughter, who can barely work a laptop, in possession of a flash drive? And why was she seemingly hiding it from us? As a parent, it's easy to jump to conclusions. A million different scenarios each worse than the last, passed through my head when Marcy told me, and judging by the look on her face, her mind was running parallel. Somehow, we both managed to stay calm. We agreed to check it out after Emma was asleep. We wouldn't even mention the flash drive to her, not until after we'd seen what was on it. That way, we would know how to approach her Marcy led Emma upstairs and put her to bed around 9 o'clock that night. When she came back down 20 minutes later, I had already plugged the drive into the back of the TV in the living room. She sat down next to me on the couch and we navigated to the correct input. There was only one folder, titled Mushi's Barnyard, on the drive. We clicked into the folder and four video files popped up. The thumbnail pictures for each video displayed some kind of cow hand puppet on a set that looked like a farm. Each was between 20 and 24 minutes long. We turned on the first episode and watched a few minutes. This cow puppet, Mushi, talked about the alphabet and colours and a few other subjects that were perfectly common for a children's show. Marcy and I both sighed in relief. It's just a TV show, Marcy said. Thank God, I replied. I wonder why Emma was hiding it. Hmm, Marcy said. Maybe she got it from Claire's brother. Claire Wilson was Emma's best friend. She lived a few blocks down the road with her parents and older brother, Jason. From what I understand, Jason is a bit of a deadbeat. He's almost 30 and he spends every waking second in the Wilson's basement, playing video games, smoking weed and drinking with his buds. What do you mean? I asked, starting to get worried again. Marcy just chuckled. Not in a bad way, hun. Claire's probably been watching this Mushi's Barnyard on TV and telling Emma how good it is. And since we don't have cable anymore, she stuck a finger at me in a joking, accusatory way. Emma can't watch it. 
Marcy stood up, stretched, the universal sign for time to go to bed, and continued. I'll bet they asked Claire's brother if he could help them download it. He probably told them that he got it and that's why she hid it from us. I turned Marcy's theory over in my head. It held water, that's for sure. And after I approached it from a few different angles, I couldn't find a hole. Case solved. Marcy took the flash drive out of the TV and put it in the odds and ends basket on top of the fridge. We talked briefly about how we were going to approach Emma about the situation and we decided that we would focus on the hiding aspect instead of the illegal downloading one. After that, we made our way to bed. I woke up a few hours later with a pit in my stomach. Even though Marcy's theory made sense, and I couldn't think of a more logical one, something didn't feel right. I grabbed my phone from the bedside table, and I googled, Mushi's Barnyard. No results. The pit in my stomach grew deeper. I decided I would not wake Marcy up. It was past four in the morning, and she had to be up for work in less than an hour. As quietly as possible, I got out of bed, went down to the kitchen, fished the flash drive out of the basket on top of the fridge, and plugged it in. The first episode continued as I remembered. Alphabet, colours, singing, dancing, etc. By the time there were only a few minutes left, the pit in my stomach was all but gone. I'd resigned myself to paranoia. But then it got weird. Time for my favourite part of the show! Mushy sang in a high-pitched voice. It's time to play Let's Help Annie! A woman appeared on the left side of the screen. Her hands were bound so tightly with rope that I could see the red marks on her side. The rope trailed away from her wrists, and it continued off screen. Her hair was greasy, and it looked like she hadn't showered in weeks. The look on her face said it all. She was terrified. I turned down the volume on the TV at this point, and I moved closer. This woman, Annie, just the sight of her was not normal for a children's show. The way she looked would, in itself, give Emma nightmares. This is Annie, boys and girls, Mushi said. Annie's in trouble, and it's up to you to help her. The farmers caught her stealing some corn, and they say the only way they'll let her go is if you help them with a few things. Annie sniffled a bit, and I saw the rope tighten briefly on her wrist, causing her to flinch. What the farmers want you to do, Mushi continued, is help them with their mouse problem. Mushi pulled out a gallon-sized plastic bag and laid it on the bench in front of him. All you need to do is catch a mouse. I like to use cheese or peanut butter. <laughs> Put it in a plastic bag like this one and seal it as tight as you can. If enough of you boys and girls will do that, then Annie will be just fine. I looked at the TV in awe. What was this? Why were they making children kill mice? And who was Annie? I'll see you in the next episode, boys and girls. <laughs> A little tune played in the background as Mushi disappeared and the video ended. After that, I watched the last five minutes of each of the other episodes, fast forwarding until Annie came into the picture. In each episode, she looked skinnier and dirtier. Cuts and bruises appeared on her forearms and shoulders. 
By episode three, she was limping. In each episode, when Mushi introduced the let's help any bit, he explained that not enough children had done what the farmers had asked. It was the boys and girls' fault that Annie looked worse in this episode. And in each episode, the farmer's demands got more worrisome. In episode two, Mushi tells the children to run away the next time they go to a store with their parents. In episode three, he tells them to go out late at night after their parents are in bed and walk around for a bit. Both worrisome, sure. But episode four is the one that sent me flying upstairs to wake up Marcy. It's a wonder that she understood anything that came out of my mouth. I was panicking, and it all came out like water from a busted hydrant. She rubbed my back to calm me down, but I could see that panic was starting to strike her too. Together, we went into Emma's room and woke her up. We found the computer stick under your mattress, sweetie. We wanted to know, where did you get it? Marcy asked. Claire gave it to me, Emma responded still rubbing the sleep from her eyes. Where did she get it? I don't know, Mummy. Have you watched it? Has Claire watched it? I tried to, but Annie was too scary. I didn't kill any mice, Mummy, I swear. Emma's eyes began to glisten with tears. Am I in trouble? Absolutely not, sweetie. But I need you to tell me. Has Claire watched it? Emma nodded. She said she watched all of them. She was going to watch the last show tonight. Marcy's head began to turn towards me, but I was at the top of the stairs before we made eye contact. Within a few seconds, I was out the front door and sprinting down the street towards Claire's parents' house. When I got there, I noticed that their front door was cracked open. Not much, only about the width of a broom handle, but enough to confirm my fear. I didn't have a weapon on me, and I couldn't find anything in the yard. I'd even forgot my phone on the coffee table. As I sprinted back to my house to call the police, I knew that I was too late. The police confirmed it shortly after. The final five minutes of the final episode of Mushi's Barnyard played back in my mind. <laughs> Good job, kids. You helped Eddie. The farmers have decided to let her go, all thanks to your hard work. All you need to do now is, after your parents go to bed, of course, call the number at the bottom of your screen, say your address, and unlock your front door. The farmers will drop her off at your house, and she'll be safe and sound. A few years ago, I was employed as an IT consultant at a biochemical research office out in the middle of nowhere in East Anglia. It usually took about an hour and a half to get from where I lived out to the office, but the pay was decent so I was quite happy with the long commute. One Sunday night in late August, I got called up at quarter to twelve from my supervisor telling me there'd been some kind of massive, system-wide crash in the evening, and she needed me to come in pronto and get it sorted. I knew I'd get good compensation, so I downed two cups of coffee, hopped in my car, and headed out for the office. The drive was mainly along a motorway, although at that hour, it was almost all populated by lorries. However, 
a good stretch took me through a track of rural countryside, which was crisscrossed by narrow roads bordered by large hedgerows and small woods. I'll admit that it was a bit creepy driving through the desolate pastures and forests at midnight on an isolated expanse of road. Thanks to the trafficless conditions, I arrived in little under an hour and I spent the rest of the night debugging, fueled by copious amounts of coffee and Red Bull. Finally, I was done by about 4.30 in the morning, by which time I was all too happy to be heading home and get some shut-eye. I stepped into my car and I waved goodbye to the security man, who, apart from my supervisor, was the only other occupant of the building at the time. I was setting off, just as the sky was starting to turn that deep, early morning blue, and the air was beginning to be filled with birdsong. I passed out of the office park where the building was located and had crossed over into the dense bockage of the country. I did my best trying to stay alert and I kept my eye on the winding road, which now seemed to be even emptier than it had been when I drove up. But after about 20 minutes, my car sputtered to a stop. I yawned and checked the tank. It was still half full. I glanced at the clock. It read five minutes to five. I quietly swore to myself. This was just about the worst possible place to break down, and my tech expertise doesn't exactly cover car engines. I switched on my old flip phone and I was surprised and damn thankful that I had any service. I made the call to AA and gave them my location, telling the operator that I had broken down. They said someone would be out as soon as possible, probably within an hour. I was extremely tired, but I decided to keep myself awake by getting out into the fresh morning air. It was getting lighter, and the surrounding landscape was bathed in the morning blue. But I estimated it would still be an hour before the sun came up. Lighting up a cigarette, I stood there smoking against my car for a few minutes, quietly surveying the topography of the land. My part of the road was sandwiched between a small copse and a field bordered by tall hedges that rose into a slight hill, topped with a large tree. The road ahead was on an incline, so I couldn't see much beyond where it crested at the top. Through the trees of the copse, I could make out the shape of what appeared to be an old arms cottage, although I think it must have been abandoned. It can't have been more than about a minute after I'd put out my cigarette when I saw a dim yellow light, which I assumed was from a low battery flashlight approaching from the road ahead and led by three dark figures. I stood upright and I squinted into the darkness, thinking that they were perhaps masochistic joggers or farm labourers heading off for work. However, as the silhouettes got closer and became clearer, I saw that they were not holding flashlights at all but rather old-fashioned lanterns with wicks burning away in small glass boxes. As they approached, I got a look at them in the morning light, and by the way they were dressed, I thought they must be going to some kind of reenactment or something. One of them was a policeman, but instead of wearing a high-vis vest and a heavy belt, he was dressed as an old village constable with a black uniform and shiny buttons, and with an honest-to-God silver whistle chain dangling out of his pocket. Another was in the garb of a farmer, with a tweed suit and a flat cap, and he seemed to be holding something heavy. As he got closer, I realised that it was a double-barreled shotgun, which made me more than a little nervous. I couldn't get a good look at the last one, 
not until they came right up to me, as he was in all black. But as soon as I glimpsed his collar, I realized that he must have been a vicar. As they approached me, I could see by their eyes that they were all terrified. The constable spoke first. Pardon, sir, but have you seen a lass in white come down this way? He spoke in broad Norfolk, and he seemed overly formal in his address. Um, no, sorry. Is something wrong? At that, they turned to each other. Reverend? said the man in tweed. The vicar seemed deep in contemplation. If she hasn't come along the road, then she'll be miles away by now, said the constable. Nonsense. She couldn't possibly get out over the fence before dawn, declared the man in tweed, looking towards the vicar, although he said nothing in response. We'd need a bloody aeroplane to catch her now, George. There's no chance she hasn't gotten away. This solemn declaration was followed by a moment of awkward silence. Not unless she went into the wood, the reverend said eventually. Well... That's it then. Come on, said the farmer, motioning towards the cops. I won't go in there, George, and that gun of yours won't do naught to save us, and I reckon you know it too, Reverend. If she gets away, then it's on our hands, said the vicar quietly. Let's just pray we find her before daybreak. The constable nodded gravely and the trio turned towards the small group of trees. Can I be of any help? I finally asked, although, to be honest, I was afraid of saying anything. It didn't matter though, as the vicar slowly turned and looked towards me as if he'd heard a very soft noise. It was as if they could no longer see me at all. I was at once glad and terrified. With that, the three of them trudged off, and I watched as the ghostly procession crossed over the low dry stone wall bordering the copse, and with the vicar leading them, they disappeared into the trees. I stood still against my car, trying to figure out what the hell had just happened, but after a few minutes, I came to the conclusion that in my sleep-deprived state, I must have begun to hallucinate. Although, I reasoned that nothing like that had ever happened to me before. My eyes kept on drooping, so I lit up another cigarette, and I decided to walk up the adjacent field, which was bordered by a bridleway that led up the knoll. I crossed over a narrow footbridge, and followed up the side of the field until I reached the large oak tree that stood on the hilltop. From here, I surveyed the landscape hidden by the ridge, which was all broad fen country, crisscrossed with hedgerows, sunken streams and canals. From my view on the slight promontory, I could not make out a single hamlet, farmstead or grain silo for miles. There was a remarkable absence of any sign of human habitation. I was suddenly struck with just how bizarre it was that these three men must have been trekking for miles in the dark, with only the dim light of their lanterns. By then, I was sure that they must have been real, for I could very clearly picture their worried and haggard faces in my mind. Something odd I noticed was that the trees that bordered the side of the road, which I thought had made up a small copse, seemed to stretch out a good ways further and consisted of a considerable track of dense woodland now lit up by the red sky of the early dawn. I couldn't quite reconcile this in my mind as I distinctly remembered stopping on the side of the road and glancing at the old alms cottage through the thin tree line. Now, the trees enveloped the land and the cottage was nowhere to be seen. Just then, I heard a very distant but very discernible crack, 
which I immediately realized must have been a gunshot. I put out my cigarette, just as the tip of the sun crested on the horizon, and I took one last glance westward before heading down. When I spotted something, coming towards me from the other side of the hill. There was a distant white figure bounding up the bridleway at quite a pace. I can't quite describe the sensation, but I suddenly felt oppressively tired. My vision blurred, and I was struck by a sharp headache, similar to the feeling you get when you stand up too quickly. This was accompanied by a feeling of unrelenting and biting dread. As my head cleared, I watched the white shape draw nearer. It almost appeared to be limping and running at once. I believed at the time that the strange figure was a woman, for I could see long, black hair fluttering against the wind. I vainly shouted to see if she was alright but I was met with no reply. The unknown woman in white only continued bounding up the bridleway, seemingly faster than before. I was now increasingly worried, and I looked around for any sign of the three strangers I had met not five minutes ago, or, indeed, anyone in the surrounding countryside. As it was, I was alone with this stranger charging towards me in her unsettling hobble. I decided I would feel safer in my car, and I turned around to walk back down the hill when what was, without a doubt, the most sickening noise I've ever heard sounded from behind me. I can't say it was a scream, for I swear it could not have been within the range of any human voice and it was more akin to a kettle coming to a boil. But this benign analogy was far from my mind when the wail resounded over the fields. It brimmed with an unrelenting rage and red-hot fury, although behind this, it was clear that the noise was wholly rooted in an irrepressibly dejected and desolate suffering. Whatever had made that sound was so fierce and frenzied and alone that I had no doubt I would have met an awful end had I not taken off running down that hill. Before I fled, I hurriedly looked back in terror. And there it was. Not twenty feet away. I knew then that it was an impossible distance to have closed in the two seconds that had elapsed since I had first heard its wail. But there it was, half limping, the speed of an Olympian. I ran. I ran like I had never run before. And as I raced down that bridleway, I heard that noise a second time. And once more, before I reached the hedgerow that bordered the road. By then, I could hear it moving on the ground, its uneven steps heaving it forward at an unnaturally fast pace. I leapt over the footbridge and I ran out into the road, nearly out of breath, and now with the awful realization that I could not outrun my pursuer. Just as I reached my car, I heard the hum of a distant engine and I hurriedly looked up the road where a dark shape was crossing the distant horizon. As I shaded my eyes from the sun, I caught a glimpse of the flashing yellow emergency lights of a double-A repair vehicle descending the road ahead. I spun around, expecting to be confronted by that dreadful, limping white figure. But the road was empty. I was alone. Incredulous, I looked up at the hill scanning the fields for any trace of the woman in white. I found none. Ten minutes later, I was sitting in the passenger seat of the tow truck, listening to the AA repairman going on about the advantages of an early morning shift. Somehow, 
the banality of my situation seemed utterly ridiculous. The adrenaline was still coursing through me, and needless to say, I didn't sleep until the following evening. Just as we departed that stretch of road, we both heard a barely audible gunshot. The repairman remarked that it must be rabbit hunters, but I remained silent. As the truck crested the ridgeline, I glanced back towards the hill, and I caught sight of a piece of white fabric stuck in the oak tree, and I watched as it wrestled itself free with the breeze and fluttered off towards the sunrise.